I am delighted to welcome you to this evening's event with blogger and cookbook writer Amy McCoy. Um, before we get started tonight, I just want to take a moment to remind you of a couple of events coming up in the store. Uh, we still have tickets on sale for this Wednesday's reading with Jennifer Weiner, um, the best-selling author of Little Earthquakes and Good in Bed, among many others. Uh, and she'll be reading from her new novel, Fly Away Home, on Wednesday at 6 p.m. at the Brattle Theater. Um, and $5 tickets for that are on sale now. And next Thursday, the 29th, um, join some of Harvard Bookstore's buyers, along with local publisher representatives, for a preview of, of titles coming out this fall. And they'll be talking about new books by favorite writers, as well as by first-time novelists, um, next Thursday at 7 p.m. in the store. Um, so please, for more, events, uh, for more information about upcoming events, pick up an events flyer on your way out this evening, or visit us online at harvard.com. And now it's my pleasure to welcome to the store Amy McCoy. Um, in, a for <laughs> in a former life, Amy McCoy was a successful freelance producer for network and cable television, and she ate great food without, tr without worrying too much about what it cost. Um, but when the recession hit, her work started to dry up while her gourmet appetite remained. Thus began her blog, Poor Girl Gourmet, devoted to delicious and eye-catching recipes that wouldn't overextend the budget. Her new cookbook, also called Poor Girl Gourmet, contains a number of budget-conscious recipes, shopping tips, wine suggestions, and whole meal ideas. And topping my list of things to try are the pea soup with mint and the cinnamon roasted chicken with orange cinnamon sauce. Um, I was drooling writing my intro this morning. Um, after the talk tonight, we will have time for questions, followed by a signing. Um, and there are cookies and couscous and all sorts of great things tonight, so she'll tell you more about that. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank anyone who purchases a copy of the book here this evening. Um, by doing so, you're supporting both a local independent bookstore and this author series. And now please join me in welcoming Amy McCoy. Rachel, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I want to thank Harvard Bookstore for having me here tonight and for all of you guys for coming out in this heat. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of a draw of air conditioning, which is nice, but there's also free food. Um, so as Rachel was saying, oh, and also I'm totally all about the supporting your independent local bookstore. I've been doing my tour all at independent local bookstores, um, not at chains, and I think that's an important thing because we want to support our local businesses and, and support the people in our communities. So, and I, you know, I can attest to that um, coming from my unemployed place that I was in, so we want to support the people that we know. So I wanted to start out, before I start talking about me and my book, I wanted to ask you guys um, if there are any things that you do to save money on your food bill. Anyone? There's something in it for you. <laughs> yes? OK, well, that is something I have never tried. But for that, you are getting. <laughs> Okay. You, Sarah, are going to get a red leaf lettuce plant. Oh, that's good. Okay, I saw some other hands over here. Yeah. I do dry tomatoes. Very smart. Okay, so let's see. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some basil. I propagated these basil, so all the basil plants that I'm giving out are propagated. Okay, yes. yes, but only for things that you actually would normally use, not for things that you would not use that are just a lure, right? That does count. <laughs> Absolutely, no waste. <laughs> okay, so I am giving you, this is a romaine seed start. Um, this is just in case anyone's wondering, like, oh, I don't want to go spend the money on the terracotta pot when you need to transplant your basil or your lettuce. You just take a little tin, um, what are these called? They're tin cans, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you can just um, cut little holes in the bottom of them using a screwdriver and a hammer, empty it out, clean it out, put some dirt in there, and off you go. Okay. Okay. Here we go. All right, anyone else? Yes. I buy only vegetables that are on sale and figure out how to cook them later. Yes. Exactly. That actually was a lot of what I did when I first started my blog. So I'm going to try to give you, let's see, we'll give you, oh, if they're all just on sale, I'm going to give you some Thai basil. Okay. Thank you. There you are. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. I don't know if this is going to be a great guess, but they have leftovers. Um, we 
That absolutely counts because you're not wasting food. Okay, let me give you a little green basil. There you go. So not wasting food is key. Um, we've talked about cutting the uh, cutting the milk. We've talked about baking our own bread. I use less of a vegetable to make soup. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna give you some fresh lettuce. And we're soon to share seeds in a moment. Um, okay, so I think that you do get another. No, okay, we'll share it with someone nearby. Okay. All right, anyone else? These are all great answers. I'm really, I'm thrilled that everyone has participated. Um, and so anyone who's feeling a little left out of the plant thing, raise your hand. You can have a plant. I have plants. <laughs> Okay, I also, um, I just wanted to show you guys because I said that I would show you how I propagated basil. So one of the things that I do is I grow a lot of my own food. And I realize it's not practical in Cambridge and in city environments all the time. But I do try to advocate for people to grow at least one potted herb or like the lettuce is a pretty simple thing to grow on a windowsill. You know, you can just pick the leaves off as you need them. But what I did was, and don't tell any farmers that I told you, but if you go to the farmer's market and you just get the already cut basil, and you put it in water, it will eventually sprout roots. So does anyone want a pet? <laughs> pet? <laughs> Nobody wants a pet. I can't believe it. All right. I can't give, can't give away free pets. All right. So anyway, what I, that is one of my things is that I do like to grow my own food. So for those of you who are interested, I've got some lettuce seed here, which I'm just going to hand out. And you can take one and pass along if you don't want it. No big deal. It's all good. So okay, my situation is that I had been a television producer for 13 years when the recession hit in 2008. And I had done very well financially. It was a good job, except that I didn't like it at all. <laughs> um, it was not creative. It was not very stimulating. And I was really in charge of budgets, schedules, managing personnel, managing the clients. So I had always been looking for something else to do. My husband and I had always been into food. That was always a thing that we were into. My husband, when I first moved in, I sort of just showed up with my toothbrush and toothpaste and a little overnight bag. And anyway, I arrived on his doorstep, and he already had cows. So we had cows when, we, uh, when I first moved in. And then we, started, we tried making cheese. We were not terribly successful at that. We, um, it was just a hobby. Um, we had a very big garden, which the first year that I got to his house, because it was his house. First year I got there, I was like, okay, I want a huge garden, right? So I wanted this enormous garden, 20 by 60. I planted mint, I planted oregano, I planted things that take over your garden, like in abundance. So I had like five different plants of mint, five different plants of oregano, and two years later I spent my entire summer digging up with a pitchfork all of the oregano and all of the mint. So I wasn't a very talented gardener at the time, not very experienced either. But so we always had this background in food, and every time I'd ask my husband, what do I want to be when I grow up? He'd be like, I don't know, but I think it has to be something in food. So I went and I looked at culinary schools. I tried to figure out whether or not I could pull that off. I didn't really want to be a chef, so I wasn't sure why I was going to spend all this money on culinary school to begin with. So I kept on marching on in my little job that I didn't like. And then all of a sudden, the work started to dry up sort of around June of 2008. And I was still working on a project. I see one of my friends who's in production nodding. Yes. <laughs> started to really slow down in June. And then this dear friend of ours came over the house in August, and he said, he listens to NPR all day long, and he said, oh, I just heard on NPR that there's going to be this huge meltdown after Labor Day. Everyone's going to come back from their summer vacations, and the credit markets are going to freeze, and the economy is going to go into a standstill. And I was like, that just seems a little extreme, don't you think? Like, <laughs> Flash forward four weeks, <laughs> and all of a sudden, the entire economy is in the, you know, it's at a standstill put it nicely. And um, so anyway, I, I had this freelance job and I didn't, you know, I wasn't going to get unemployment benefits. And so most of my clients get their funding from advertising. So projects are contingent upon people spending money on advertising and car companies tend to be big advertisers with cable networks. 
So they didn't, you know, they just didn't have any money to spend. So I remember sort of thinking, well, maybe this will be four weeks, or maybe it'll be eight weeks. And then I had a conversation with one of my bigger clients, and she said, well, we're not going to be doing anything out of house for a while. We've just had layoffs. Um, it's probably going to be nine months to a year. Bless you. It's probably going to be nine months to a year before we're going to be able to hire you again. And I was like, oh. So I looked at my bank account. I was like, so that's all the money I have. Awesome. So I realized that I had, and I wasn't going to be able to collect unemployment, so I knew that I was going to have to really rein it in. And because my husband and I were so into food, it just wasn't negotiable that we go and start eating things like ramen noodles, or I used to eat Lipton bags of rice with the um, like freeze-dried broccoli in them in college that cost, I think, 79 cents a pack. That wasn't happening again. So it just happened that it was October, which was fantastic because it was harvest season, and I live in a sort of rural community um, in southeastern Mass. So I was able to collect a lot of butternut squash. We ate a lot of butternut squash for like two months. And then um, you know, I just started being more and more creative, and I would do things um, just to see how much I could entertain myself also with the food because I didn't have anything else to do. I didn't have a job. So I needed to keep myself sane and I needed to be creative and I needed to feel like you know I was doing something productive and I wanted something for us to look forward to at the end of the day. I didn't want us to have my husband come home from work and say, so did you get any work today? And me say, no, and start crying in my soup. So I wanted to make it so that it was something that was like a little fun game. Now in the meantime, I had taken a class at Grub Street in Boston, maybe three years earlier, and it was a food writing class. So when I took that class, it was like all at the height of um, Julie and Julia. Everyone was all excited about that. And so the instructor had said, you know, one of you guys should start a food blog. That'll force you to write every day. And I was like, who has time to write every day? I have a job. <laughs> so anyway, hmm. again, fast forward three years, and now I don't have a job. So I have all the time in the world to write every day. So, and I did, I wrote every single day. I started this blog, and I was like, okay, well, this is how I'm going to make it seem like it's a game that we're trying to save this money. And, that, and so it's not depressing and it's a creative outlet and who knows, maybe once so, someone will see my writing and they'll say, that woman can write an article for us, that'd be great. And I'm like, that'd be great if I could get 50 cents a word, that would supplement my non-income, this is going to be so cool. So, um, so anyway, that was sort of the premise I went with. I was like, I'm going to treat this as a game and my first post actually was about, I'm calling this a game. I'm trying to feed us as well as I can for the least amount of money that I can. So. Then I emailed the people at Grub Street and I said, oh, by the way, I finally took your instructor's advice and I, I started this food blog. So about two weeks later, they put it in their e-newsletter and the next day I got an email from an agent. I know you guys know that that's not how this works. So, <laughs> and I know that's not how this works either, but I, um, I got the email and I nearly hyperventilated and I thought about breathing into a, into a paper bag, but then I went for a walk instead, and I finally called her back, and she said, so I'm just wondering, do you think that you could do a, a book proposal? And I said, yeah. I have no idea what she's asking me, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> so we went over it. I remember I had my little notebook, and I, she was like, okay, so first of all, you're going to write about the market. And I'm like, the market, okay, the market. So I wrote all these notes, <laughs> and I started writing this book proposal, and I did it between Thanksgiving and New Year's of 2009. So I sent it off to her on the Monday after New Year's, and she said, wow, I can't believe you gave this to me the, right after New Year's. I'm like, well, you told me you wanted it right after New Year's. <laughs> I worked in television. You don't miss a deadline. So anyway, she, I guess that's not always typical either. So anyway, um, I didn't quite get it right, because as you might imagine, saying yes to something I didn't completely understand, I didn't really know what I was doing. So um, there were some sections, like the marketing section, that I didn't understand. And um, so we reworked that. And then she wound up sending it out to 11 different publishers that she had pre-qualified. And some of them were like, that's a great idea, except no one knows who this woman is. She's like, you know, this imaginary person in Rehoboth, Massachusetts, sitting in her barn like that has, you know, three people that know who she is. So anyway, we finally got down to, we talked to four different publishers, and we did conference calls with them. And uh, it came down to three of them, three bid. And I went with the publisher I went with, um, first of all, because they were just so friendly on the phone. <laughs> But they also wanted to include color photographs, and I thought that was really important in a cookbook. I personally don't like a cookbook that doesn't have pictures. How do I know what I'm making? <laughs> I want to see it. So, um, so anyway, there was that. And then also the other thing was that my editor, who was, like I said, very, very nice. I totally had a girl crush on her. Um, she was so, so nice, and she said, you know, I want you to do a couple of different um, sidebars, she called them at the time. Well, it turns out they actually were more her way of getting me to write essays because on the blog, I, I sort of, I'm very long-winded. Surprise. So, so anyway, 
I, on the blog, I tend to write a long essay and then get to the recipe. And so that wasn't going to happen in the book because no one's going to read four pages before they get to like, how am I going to make the Israeli couscous salad, right? So, you know, and me going on about my childhood, not enough, right? Like, like not going to work. So this was her way of getting me to do essays, and there were two of them. And so one, she said, I want you to do a sidebar. I, I'm thinking sidebar, it's like those instructional bits on the side, sides of articles on gardening and canning. And I, of course, immediately fell into a panic because I'm like, I'm not a master gardener. I'm not a master canner. <laughs> But I have been doing those things for a long time, and as we know, um, I do grow my own food. So I'm going to read you just a little excerpt about gardening, just to, uh, to reinforce that anyone really can garden. OK. So my husband's name is JR. And this is, if you have a book in your hand and you want to read along, it's uh, page 32. Okay. JR had lived at the house we share now for just about 10 years before my toothbrush and I showed up. And when I did, there was already a full complement of Black Angus cattle. Seven, in fact. Far too many for our property. Living here. Sorry, I didn't read that very well. <laughs> JR did keep a garden before I unpacked my bags, but I wanted something a little larger, a little more ambitious than his normal wee garden. I stood by the chicken coop, watching him till the soil with his tractor that first year. Oh, yes. I wanted something quite grand, I did. My only previous experience gardening had come the year earlier at my live alone apartment, and that garden hadn't been a su terribly successful endeavor. The apartment house, an antique colonial with sloping floors and bowed walls, was where I began cooking in earnest, making my first dinner for JR, one that caused him to repeatedly tell his friends, she makes cream of mushroom from soup from scratch. I created elaborate meals, fancy sandwiches to take along to the beach, fresh lemonade, stews, cakes. Many of these dishes are still in my repertoire today. And I started a garden during the second week of June in New England. An elderly man who lived in the building came out to assess my progress. What's that you're planting, he asked. Oh, these are tomatoes, I cheerfully replied. Now, if you don't garden, you might not know that tomato plants are easily recognizable as such. The gentleman had come out to ask because I was planting seed <laughs> during the second week of June. He sighed softly, took a moment to determine how precisely to let me down, and said, I believe you want to start that, those tomato seeds a little bit earlier. Brushing the hair out of my eyes, I can reenact this. <laughs> As I stood up and not yet deterred, I replied, oh, OK. Like how much earlier? Like March. <laughs> so that was my gardening experience up until the point when I moved in and started um, enlisting, we'll call it the nice term, enlisting my husband to do all of my garden bidding. So this was, but this was my editor's way of allowing me to do some creative writing within the context of a cookbook, which was really a nice combination of the two things, the food, the recipe development, and also the writing. And then, of course, um, the fact that I was able to do the photography, this was a way that I combined all of the things I'd been interested in while I had been whining about my television job and actually was able to do something with it in the end. And so that was... It was a really amazing, amazing experience and an amazing opportunity to have um, being the woman in the barn in Rehoboth knowing three people in the world. So, so that is sort of the story of my, uh, of my book. Questions? Yes. Did you do your own I did, yes. And I did it on my back deck. It was very highbrow. <laughs> 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 yes, I would, um, because I would get up in the morning. I also, oh, I'm sorry. I probably left out a little bit that you might, might be interested in. So. I, the book deal was done on March 23rd, and I delivered the manuscript on August 4th. So I basically had like four months to, to write the book and shoot all the photography, which was insane. But again, it was like the book proposal. I didn't know it. I didn't know that it was insane. So I just agreed to it. Sure, that sounds great. I can do that. <laughs> so and one of the other things about, um, I'm sorry, one of the other things was that in writing the recipes for the book, I, you know, where I was able to source things from my farmer neighbors, my prices were lower usually on the blog. And so when I started doing the prices for the book, I wanted to make sure that everything was under $15 for four people, that it was easily under $15 so that I didn't use sale prices. I didn't say you need to clip coupons. I just said, OK, here's the price if you just go and shop. And then I wanted to make sure that all the ingredients were easily available for people. Like There wasn't any, like, you have to jump through hoops to find this one particular ingredient. I wanted them to be things you could easily find in the supermarket. So that's how the a lot of the recipes came to be very simple, because it was all about what's commonly available. And also, when you don't have a lot of money, you can't use a lot of ingredients. So it was really just trying to figure out the best way to bring out flavors 
using the least amount of ingredients and the least amount of money. Yes? I assume you food stylist. No, I'm the food stylist. <laughs> Absolutely. It absolutely does. <laughs> yes, there was nothing. There were no um, no brushes, no, uh, there was no press powder put on anything or anything like that. No hairspray. <laughs> yes, it was all, okay, well, that looks pretty today. Great. I'm going to take a picture of it now. You know, I did, um, initially I started out trying to get a good representation of the different seasons because I felt like that was important. Initi my initial idea was that I was going to do this book but broken out by seasons. And then I realized with my four months that I wasn't going to have enough time to get into the fall and winter to test those recipes as well as I would have liked. So I had to go with things I already knew I had in my repertoire. So part of it was recipes I was already using, um, family favorites to start with. And then once we got into spring and summer, that actually allowed me to start just thinking about, I would think about what flavor do I really like and what do I want to try? And so if it was peas, I would be like, okay, well, if I puree the peas and I combine them with fresh ricotta and I make a pea puree lasagnette, what's that going to be like? And so I would, you know, so some of it was, these are my standbys and some of it was, all right, let's cut loose. It can be all creative, all, you know, do whatever I want as long as it met the, re the price requirement. And I had one, um, one side dish I'm really sad about. It was a mushroom and potato hash, and it was delicious, but I couldn't find anything to pair it with that would keep the whole meal under $15. So I was like, well, I'm sorry, mushroom and potato hash, you have to go. So there was a lot of back and forth between like the ideas and then the reality of the money. Um, no, it's not, I haven't posted it, I will. Do you know that, I promise. <laughs> I have actually a whole backlog of recipes from working on the book that are things that are very tasty and, you know, with the right sale. And that was the other thing because I w wasn't pricing it for, you know, if you wanted to get sirloin tips to go with that mushroom and potato hash, that would be delicious, except I couldn't guarantee you were going to find those on sale and I didn't want to make it so that it was like, you know, here's the pressure. You, ha you can only do this when you can find this on sale and not, so that was that, uh, that thinking. Anyone else? Oh, yes. Cheese, anyone other than your family is like the, um, yeah. There's a guinea pig in the front row near you. She's right there, the old bag. <laughs> <laughs> there were a few people, but there were not a ton of people that I, that I used. I would send them off. My sister-in-law made a lot of the recipes, and then I recruited a few friends here and there to, to try them, and I primarily tested them and retested them, and made sure that I was, the language was clear and that they did actually taste good the second and third times around, so. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Well, back in eighth grade, no. <laughs> I did, um, I took photography as, you know, in eighth grade, honestly, and I did like darkroom photography and all that good stuff. And I went to college for television, radio, film production, so I did shoot video when I was in college. Um, but I'm not a trained photographer, and I actually had started uh, maybe 1997 or so, I started fooling around with my husband's old SLR, like the whole manual, like all, all manual all the time. So I started fooling around with that and I would take pictures and people would be like, those are artsy. <laughs> and then I eventually got to, um, I was doing, I was, because I was always trying to figure out what it was I was going to be when I grew up, I was always taking continuing ed classes. So I was taking this class at, um, at RISD in their continuing ed program. And it was a handmade, um, handmade paper class. And I was like, oh, I love handmade paper. It's the greatest thing ever. So I'm going to do something with handmade paper because you can see there's a lot of commerce around handmade paper, right? So <laughs> I can definitely make a living at that. But I took, then wound up taking this workshop on Martha's Vineyard on handmade paper. And they did a little Polaroid transfer um, session there. And so I started doing Polaroid transfers. And I did those starting in 2000. And I wound up doing them to a point where I do license some of those. Um, I make like $40 a quarter on my licensing. <laughs> makes me so rich but um but so I had sort of gotten to a point oops, where I'd gotten to a point where I was actually able to at least market them professionally whether they're not being paid professionally but um so then with the food it was actually a very different thing though because I went from my Polaroid transfers from more landscapes 
And so then to come down to this macro level and really look closely at food, it's sort of it's really fascinating actually if you photograph food because you get right in there and you see just there's a lot of beauty in food. It sound very corny, I realize, but I'm going with it. <laughs> I did. I shot all of them digitally. So, and that was actually really uh, fortunate because I had managed to get a digital SLR be just before I stopped work, like at the beginning of 2008, <laughs> when I was convinced I was going to continue working for the rest of the year. So, but it worked out in the end. So, yes. You know, I come from a family of really good cooks. My grandmother actually had an Italian restaurant in Rhode Island and then in Southeastern Mass. Um, so there's a history there. My mother was a scratch cook. I mean, she's a fabulous cook and baker. And so we just um, were raised as cooking is just what you do. And so cooking always, even when I was producing television, I might get home at 8.30 at night, but I would still start cooking a full meal because that was my creative release after a whole day of are we on schedule or are we on budget? And by the way, you know, have you called this one? Have you done that? And so I'd be like, okay, I'm going to chop onions now. <laughs> But so that was my release. So I had been um, definitely self-trained, but through a family tradition of it. Anyone else? Yes. So as the first meal, Oh, that's a nice way to phrase what is your favorite <laughs> dish in the cookbook. I like that. That's the first time I've heard it phrased that way. Well, here's the thing. I, um, for me, I, of course, really love all of them because they're like my little children, you know, so I've got, it's sort of hard to be like, oh, this is my favorite favorite recipe. Right now, though, I'm craving the tomato tart. Um, I also, people have been talking about the roasted cauliflower. I have not roasted the cauliflower in like maybe since March. And so I've heard, actually this woman on Twitter, because I'm on Twitter all the time. So this woman on Twitter was like, Tuesday's my payday. So guess what? I'm going to have to have the cauliflower the day before. <laughs> but the ca roasted cauliflower with um, whole wheat spaghetti is delicious. Um, you know, the uh, if you're splurging, the fish cakes are really good. Um, the pork chops are really good. In fact, I was thinking I might make pulled pork. Oh, and also the blueberry crumble. Blueberries are in. Get that going. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so not very helpful, but my husband, if he were to pick one dish from the book, it's the untraditional bolognese. So, and I make that probably every other week during the winter because that's real stick to your ribs and doesn't feel like it's, you know, $3.79 worth of meat and and have it for a few days, so. So, sorry, that wasn't a very concise answer. <laughs> That's what I'm aiming for. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Blueberries and... I haven't, but that's a really good idea. I think that I will, um, now that you, I've got all these things on my list of things I'm going to make from scratch, like crystallized ginger, um, you know, I'm going to make ketchup. I've got all, you know, I'm like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But I think actually making some sort of an herbal wine or like a flower wine would be an interesting experiment. So I like that. Thank you for the suggestion. Awesome. <laughs> and then I'll have friends over. <laughs> yes. I would be happy to do that, honestly. I work, um, I work with Slow Food Rhode Island. I'm the leader of Slow Food Rhode Island. So we do a lot of educational outreach. And I really feel like that's a, that is a need that, you know, that's, an, that's a segment of the population that really needs some assistance in understanding, like, it's not that difficult to cook. And I understand there are problems, of course, with what neighborhood you're in in order to have access to the food. But, you know, I would definitely be, I'd be happy. I'll give you my card. If you, so I would love to do that. I think that would be great. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, the two buck chuck? Yeah, or three. Or three bucks now, yeah. They're inexpensive. No. <laughs> no, I think, you know, if um if they're to someone's taste, then that is perfectly acceptable. And I know I just finally got to the um the legacy place, um, Whole Foods in Dedham, which is like, you know, it's like the Mecca of uh of Whole Foods, really, on the East Coast, I think. I mean, I'm sure there's something else that's better. But anyway, they have a crazy wine section, and they do have a bunch of $4 and $5 and $6 wines, which I haven't tried yet. Um, my interest in wine is I like to have wines that are 
lesser known, so they're a little more interesting. And if I can get to seven dollars or six dollars or even five dollars a bottle, then you know, go for it. But um, not just on price alone, you know. And I honestly, um, well, of course, I love the Trader Joe's. I'm I'm slandering your brand. <laughs> But I do think, I mean, I know a lot of people that that's a, that's a great wine, you know. It's just I guess I have access to other wines that, that are also, there we have it. Yep, for three, right. Yeah. I just sort of, I like to mix it up too, so. And I think also great value for cooking. Like if you get a three-buck chuck for cooking, then, oh, yeah, definitely. And freeze it in cubes, and then you can use it in stews later, like whatever's left over. I'm here to help you. <laughs> um, any other questions? I actually have one. Yes. You talked a lot about how much of a whirlwind it was. You started the blog, and then a few weeks later you started Teeny Agent, and then you know, sort of all these things happened one right after the other. Do you have a sense of what's next? Do you have a sense of what you're going to do when you grow up now? I'm not sure that I do, and that's a problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, and I I've been thinking, you know, I I actually had done a production job. One of my friends who's here um, hooked me up with a job. Thank you. Uh, hooked me up with a job when I was done with the book, and I worked on that up until just the beginning of July. So I, I needed to work. I mean, I it was ugly at the end. <laughs> it was not a pretty time. Um, but I've started thinking about I'd like to do cooking classes. I would definitely like to write more. Um, you know, it's trying to figure out how you make a living as a like a working writer, but. And that's something I, it's just sort of, it's, I know that sounds really ridiculous probably, but it's sort of foreign to me and it's a whole new territory that I'm entering into. So, and you know, hopefully if the book does well enough, they'll give me a second book deal and I can write a second cookbook and hopefully not in like four months. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you all. I'm so glad you all came out. This is exciting. Yay. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, one thing. It's like a buffet, and then you can get some Israeli couscous and a cookie, <laughs> if you'd like. Plates, napkins, forks, they're all here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we have copies of the book for sale at the registers. We're going to have the signing up here at the front, and the food's all up here at the front, so come this way. Um, thank you so much for coming.